is one of 56 organisations across Australia who work with communities to help look after our environment, our water and our land. The region includes all the nine catchments of the wet tropics and it's a pretty critical location for the health of the Great Barrier Reef overall. Water quality is a really important thing for the wet tropics. It's something that we all rely on, whether it's something that you use for everyday purposes or for your own business or for agriculture and more importantly for the general environment, including the Great Barrier Reef. Water quality is a really important component that maintains uh, life for a number of plants and animals, but it also uh, keeps that connection between the catchment and the reef. We have a whole bunch of local endemic species in this region that are found nowhere else in the world. So they're, they're only special to this region and we're still finding new ones. We know that agriculture is an important part of our landscape and it's a major land user of the catchments that feed into the Great Barrier Reef. Industry was another sector that works in this region and can have an impact. We have all living towns and cities, so there's an urban impact. At this stage, uh, I would argue that a bunch of our fish have evolved in, in some really pristine streams with high, uh, high water quality coming off really steep mountain areas. So they're probably used to really good water quality. Um, but how far we can push them with changing that water quality, I'm not quite sure. In this region, there's a, a lot of different things that are affecting the marine assets. And we look at the system as a whole, looking at things like your seagrass, your coral reefs, your coastal wetlands your estuaries and your islands and caves that are in the region and all the species that obviously depend on those habitats. If you clear an area of a wetland or the floodplain, you're going to get changes to the amount and content of the water that gets to the Great Barrier Reef. And that's led to changes over time in those coastal ecosystems like the wetlands and the mangroves, but also the inshore reefs and the seagrass. Seagrass serve a lot of roles in our marine environment. One of the most obvious to people is that seagrass are important for large charismatic megafauna like dugongs and turtle. But seagrass are also that foundation of the area of our seabed. They provide habitat for a lot of fish, particularly fish which are important for commercial fisheries. Seagrass help stabilise sea, the seabed. Uh, they also help baffle our coastlines from the wave action. So it can also help to prevent a certain amount of erosion. The Great Barrier Reef in general, despite some recent reports that it's in good condition, is not. We've lost large amounts of coral, um, both inshore and offshore. We've lost large amounts of seagrass, dugongs, turtles, and other precious things in the Great Barrier Reef, across the Great Barrier Reef, and it's getting worse. The years of um, land development, we've had changes in land use from a more uh, vegetated, pristine state in the catchments to a much more developed catchment. With those changes, you see differences in how much um, runoff of water you get, and that runoff contains sediment as well as nutrients and pesticides, depending on the land uses. Well, seagrasses are highly dependent on the quality of water that they survive within. So if that water quality declines, the seagrasses will all similarly decline. It's been shown that um, fertiliser runoff can feed crown of thorns, starfish outbreaks. And basically uh, the surveys that have been done over the last 27 years show that about uh, half the reef is gone and 40% of that can be attributed to crown of thorns, starfish. One of the new freshwater ecosystem types we haven't really been thinking about is the short steep coastal streams. We do like those areas for resorts and caravan parks and they're the sort of places we like to visit and we're finding some really special things in those streams. So that's presenting us with some new challenges for how we've got to think about how much water can we extract from those streams, um, visitation by both local and international tourists. Whilst 90% of the pollution going into the Great Barrier Reef comes from agricultural lands, 10% comes from urban. Potentially things like phosphorus runoff is a big issue through detergent loss and 
um, runoff from dog excreta and fertil lawn fertilisers and light industrial areas and things like that. We've never really examined um, other emerging contaminants from sewage treatment plants before, like the pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Within the Great Barrier Reef, we see the wet tropics as the jewel in the crown, as well as probably the biggest risk to the reef. So to save the reef, we really have to fix up what's happening in the wet tropics. There are a lot of threats that we can't manage. You know, we can't manage things like storms and cyclones. Um, we can't directly manage um, other impacts that are going to increase in the future, climate related impacts, things like rising sea temperatures. And so by having a healthy system, there's at least the ability for it to cope with those sort of disturbances, particularly into the future as they increase. where we should do the best work to ensure that we have great water quality for the wet tropics. And one way that we do that is we complete a water quality improvement plan. The long-term vision of the water quality improvement plan is to have a water quality level that protects the values and the uses that the community have agreed on. So obviously it's about protecting aquatic ecosystems, but equally it's about the water quality they need for their recreational uses, for fishing, for industrial uses like irrigation and stock watering. So we pull all our information together on our scientific understanding of the system. We talk to the community about what their values and uses of their waterways are. Then based on them and our best water quality guidelines, we come up with water quality objectives that we want to achieve to protect those values and uses. A prioritisation exercise for where we need to spend money best and in what industries and in what activities and in which part of which catchments that we need to actually reduce the problem the most. And examples of things might be improving land management practices with farmers, uh, reducing the amount of fertiliser that they use or how they, the timing of how they put pesticides on. So then our task is to look at the alternative management strategies that we can implement, assess them for what water quality improvement we get, what's the cost and what's the social acceptability and then based on that assessment, which are the actions that we'll go forward with and implement over the next five years? We implement those actions and monitor the response and see how well we're going and then repeat that cycle when we have to update the water quality improvement plan in another five years time. Water quality improvement plan has been funded by the Australian Government and Terrain is completing the project on behalf of the community of the wet tropics. There's been a lot of activity already working with farmers around changing their practices on the ground, but we need to take that further. And we also need to think about the things that are going to make a difference in the future and start planning for those now. Terrain is really proud to say that one of the great things about doing water quality improvement plan is working with everybody else. And that includes scientists and researchers, farmers, peak bodies, the Australian and the Queensland governments, catchment groups, other community groups, they all are such an important part of developing a plan together.